Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our event tonight here at the AAA Queensland. Um, Paul Lucas could be here tonight, so he's asking to step in for me. My name is Simon McCluskey, I'm the Vice President of the AAA. And it is wonderful to see so many faces in the audience tonight. It's one thing we've really missed is having people on site, and it's terrific to be able to gather like this. And obviously we have our Zoom uh, participants as well, so welcome to, to them as well. Um, and everybody looks ready for the great event that we have lined up for you tonight. So it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Carl Hins to the um, podium at the moment. He is a partner of Holden Redlick a Corporate and Commercial Group and is national head of Holden Redlick's China practice. Before joining the firm, Carl worked for over 10 years in mainland China and Hong Kong in the fields of investment banking and law. Carl is the co-editor of Oxford University Press Financial Services Regulation in Asia Pacific. He is fluent in Mandarin um, and is a recognised expert in Chinese business culture. He has guest lectured on law and culture at the East China University of Politics and Law, the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics, the China European International Business School, and the University of Queensland, where I happen to work too. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see this distinguished alumnus with us here tonight. And so without further ado, over to you, Carl. Thank you. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you all here with us at our Holding Ready office. We're very proud of our, our office here in Brisbane. So it's lovely that we can welcome you on, on, on an evening like this evening. And what a great topic for the fantastic speaker. Uh, I think it's a great pleasure for all of us to be able to listen to the Honourable Ted O'Brien uh, and a topic that is so relevant. I don't think there's a day now where you pick up a newspaper, I don't know if anyone picks up a newspaper anymore, <laughs> I go online to read my news, but there isn't a day when China is not within the first two or three main topics in the news. So I'm waiting with bated breath to hear what Ted has to say. And I haven't had a brief chat with Ted before today, and he's a very down-to-earth bloke, so I think that we'll enjoy a very frank and open conversation. And it's my pleasure to introduce Ted. Uh, Ted has quite a stellar resume, I have to say. Uh, he, he is a member of the House of Representatives in Australia, where he represents the seat of Fairfax, which I think everyone in the room will be familiar that that's on the Sunshine Coast. So it's nice of Ted to come down here to Brisbane uh, this evening. He's arguably the most experienced practitioner in the Australian Parliament when it comes to China. Certainly we're going to need experienced China practitioners uh, in the years and months ahead. He currently serves as a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties and the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, where he's also the Chairman of the Trade Subcommittee. Must be quite a challenging role at this time. He also serves on other parliamentary committees and is Chair of the Standing Committee on the Environment and Energy. Mr. O'Brien is currently leading a parliamentary inquiry into the expansion of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership and an inquiry into activating trade with Pacific Island nations. He has published several papers on China and the Australia-China relationship. So as you can see, he's eminently qualified to speak with us here this evening. Before entering parliament in 2016, Mr. O'Brien had a blue chip commercial career with over 20 years, mainly as a deal maker across the Asia Pacific in industries ranging from agriculture through to high technology. This included 12 years with Accenture, the world's third largest technology services business, where he was director of growth and strategy for the Asia Pacific and emerging markets based out of Beijing. With responsibility for M&A, joint ventures and negotiation of large commercial agreements. He also lived and worked in Taiwan and Hong Kong for several years and spent shorter periods in Singapore, Japan and South Korea. Mr O'Brien holds a range of qualifications that mainly relate to economics and commerce. He has a Bachelor of Economics and Politics from the University of Queensland, a scholarship in Chinese Mandarin from the National Taiwan Normal University, a Master of Business Administration International with first class honours from the University of Melbourne, and a Master's of Economics from the London School of Economics. He's also the personal representative of Prime Minister Morrison for South East Queensland's candidature for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympic Games. And we were chatting before uh, we were seated about this very topic, so I know several of you in the audience are very keen to hear about the Olympic Games as well and the Paralympics. He also sits... Uh, he's, uh, the Prime Minister has asked Mr O'Brien to lead negotiation on behalf of the Commonwealth with the Queensland State Government 
and the Southeast Queensland Council of Mayors on a SEQ city deal. He entered Parliament five years ago in 2016 and was re-elected in May 2019. His wife, Sophia, is a university lecturer of law and they are parents to eight-year-old Alexandra and three-year-old Henry. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make Mr Ted O'Brien very welcome. Thank you very much, Carl and Diana. I, um, I'm very happy to be here. Carl, you don't usually say before you hear the bloke speak that we've got a good speaker here tonight, so I give you full permission to that at the end. But look, I really am delighted and I want to acknowledge the Institute in particular that's played such an important role over the decades, really looking at some of Australia's most challenging topics. And so I really do genuinely feel very honoured to be invited to address you tonight about a very important topic. What I thought I might do is uh, I prepared some notes, so why don't I deliver that and then just open it up if that's okay to the floor for, for you to give me advice. <laughs> As a politician, that's why it usually works. And we're happy about that. So, look, we are here to talk, obviously, about China. Today. I wonder if we can start by first talking about ourselves. And in doing so, if we can try for no more than a minute or two to cast our mind at some point into the future. And if you choose a year for the sake of it, let's say the year 2050, and ask yourselves, what does Australia look like in the year 2050, mid-century, 29 years from now? Carl mentioned my kids. So my three-year-old boy then will be 32 and my little girl would be 38 in 2050. What sort of Australia do they live in? What sort of world do they live in? Now, I pose these questions not with a view to trying to answer them for you tonight, but to make a really simple point. And that is, I believe we spend too little time as a nation thinking about and debating about the end game. Where do we want to be, whether it's 20, 30, 40, or 50 years from now? That sort of discussion has too little oxygen in our public debate, yet it's vitally important. I do believe that resolving the China question is the greatest challenge of our time. But if we are to successfully resolve such questions with all its complexities, how can we do so without a clear line of sight to the type of future we want for ourselves, our nation, our children, and this? Now, we could spend the entire night, of course, defining what that future might look like, but it's not why we're here. So I won't progress that line of thinking much further, other than probably to make one other point. And that is, I think, there is a prerequisite for any future visioning of Australia. And that is a belief I have, that a future Australia has to be built on the foundations of a common set of values, values that bind all Australians regardless of their background, regardless of their religion, their race or their creed. And as many of you know, the most important value of all is that value of freedom. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to pursue whatever it is you want to pursue in your life. The freedom to exercise independence and self-reliance and to do so with human dignity. Ideals that, by extension, promote creative endeavour, entrepreneurship, free enterprise. For, to my mind, nothing guarantees the happiness and fulfilment of a society or the individuals within it, like freedom. And thus, what our future holds as a nation, whatever that might be, it has to be underpinned by freedom. Now, it's easy for people to criticise those who bang on about values, and, uh, and certainly politicians do. But we have to remember that a nation's foreign policy 
is ultimately a reflection of its people, who they are, and what they believe in. In other words, it's an outward expression of our values. And thus, any future visioning of Australia that's built on anything other than liberal values tempts national disunity, a fragmentation of civil society and an undermining of our system of politics and economics. But what are the challenges, of course, when you talk about the vision thing? A problem when you try to focus on what a future might look like or a preferred end game, especially when you're talking about international affairs, is the fact that we don't control all the levers that will ultimately determine if we get there to that end goal. Australia may well be the world's most successful liberal democracy. Personally, I believe we are. But we are not a major power. And so no matter the importance of the Australia-China bilateral relationship, in truth, it pales in comparison to the importance of the bilateral relationship between the United States and China in terms of what it means for the world. What will come of their bilateral relationship? Will the US and China find a new way of doing business, a competitive coexistence that rebalances supply chains to maybe exclude cooperation in strategically important areas while still maintaining free trade and a multipolar rules-based international order? Is that what's going to happen? Or will there be greater confrontation between them, a decoupling of economies and the creation of a bipolar world with different two different spheres of influence, a new Cold War, if you like? Alternatively, God forbid, might a hot war one day arrive? The cost of armed conflict is unfathomable. But as history has told us, the economics of war do not always deter its outbreak. The plausible scenarios for the future of the US-China relationship are many. And whatever eventuates will be world-defining and will have an enormous impact on Australia. But just because we don't play in that game with the major powers, just because we do not control all the levers that will determine our own future, that does not mean that Australia should passively bide its time to see which way the wind blows. Nor should we be foolishly fatalistic by presuming some predetermined future. Rather, we should firstly continue to soberly assess all plausible future scenarios for the international political economy and prepare ourselves accordingly. Secondly, despite the main game being the United States and the China relationship, we should never view our own foreign policy through that binary prism, as if it just always has to be a choice between the United States and China. Thirdly, we should stay true to who we are and what we believe in, always anchoring to our values and ensuring when we do, we keep our feet firmly planted on the ground. Now, we may not control all the levers, but we need to maximise our use of those we do control and seek to influence others who have control of those levers that we don't. And so having made some of these broader threshold comments, why don't I talk a little bit about China? Now, as many in the audience probably know themselves, in my experience, I found the Chinese immensely proud of their ancient civilization and their historical role as the Middle Kingdom or Celestial Empire. This is not some historical footnote for the Chinese. This is absolutely core to their identity. And as the former Middle Kingdom under heaven, the Chinese remember themselves as not only possessing the greatest power and most advanced economy on earth, up to probably at least the 16th century, but also as the most culturally and morally superior civilization. In ways such as these, the Chinese today 
believe they enjoy a clear line of sight between their past and their future, believing that their history preordains their destiny. It's not all about the glory days, however. There's a, a yin and a yang, if you like, to how China interprets its own identity, its own national story. China also has a memory of past tragedy and hardship. In addition to devastating natural disasters, China bears deep scars from man-made trauma. Something that's worth noting is that when China teaches its students about its historical traumas, it seems to accentuate stories of foreign powers egregiously injuring the Chinese people while seemingly masking over stories of China's own internal and self-inflicted injuries. This partly explains China's increasing assertiveness and the tendency of its diplomats to display at times aggression towards foreign powers as their own country's influence and strength rises. Beyond ongoing border disputes that we know about with India and, of course, the precarious relationship with Taiwan, China's deepest ill will is saved historically for Japan and the West, in line with its historical grievances. At this point, I wouldn't mind making just a comment if I can about Xi Jinping. Over recent times, we've heard a lot about the enormous power of Xi, with some saying his authority is on par with that held by Mao Zedong. Xi has been indeed consolidating his power, and some would argue he's riding the tiger and dare not get off for fear of himself being eaten. Personally, I think it is true that Xi Jinping is China's most powerful leader since Mao Zedong. But I caution against overstating Xi's influence on China's national identity, because doing so risks misjudging the depth and sincerity of China's new brand of nationalism. Contrary to popular opinion, the motivation behind China's wolf warrior diplomacy goes deeper than Xi Jinping. Soon after the 1989 Tiananmen Square incident, the Chinese Communist Party launched a patriotic campaign that Deng Xiaoping described as being about what China was like in the old days. This marked a shift in China's historical memory to focus on not only the glory days of the celestial empire, but also a century of humiliation. Starting from the first opium wars in 1839, to the end of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1945, during which China was defeated and subjugated by foreign powers. This patriotic campaign elicited deep feelings of victimization, which has left an indelible mark on China's national identity. This shift in its national identity was primarily driven by the Chinese Communist Party's interest in shoring up its own authority. Let us not forget that at around that time, the Cold War was coming to an end and then very quickly over. And it seemed that liberalism had won the day. And as China rapidly modernised its own people, the younger generation, were starting to rethink their connection with communism. In other words, communism's eroding relevance threatened the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. And thus it faced a risk of being stripped of its purpose and the potency of communism as a tool for mobilizing public support. While its ancient civilization generated pride in the past, and hope for the future. These positive aspects of its identity weren't enough to secure the Communist Party's ongoing authority. It needed something else to motivate its citizens and it found that something else in a renewed focus on grievances against foreign powers. 
As the Communist Party leadership transitioned from Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao and finally to Xi Jinping, so too did its call to arms transition, evolve from communism to nationalism, from class struggle to a struggle against the historical injustices of foreign powers. Xi Jinping encapsulated this new form of Chinese nationalism in his first speech to the nation in 2012, when he laid out his vision of achieving the Chinese dream of great rejuvenation. Effectively a slogan that rekindles the glory and trauma of China's past and places it within a mission statement about China's future. That is, after suffering at the hands of foreign powers through much of the 19th and 20th centuries, it is time, the Chinese believe, to correct an historical anomaly and reclaim its rightful position in the world. In China's view, this is not about becoming the global hegemon. And contrary to the view of some, I don't believe China is aiming to replace the United States per se. Instead, it is wanting to fundamentally change the international rules-based order. As Xi Jinping describes it, he wants, in his words, a new model of global partnership and a new model of major countries' relations. The risk of Xi's so-called new model is that it seeks to replace liberal values with Marxist, Leninist ones to better reflect the authoritarian nature of the Chinese Communist Party, meaning less transparency, more leverage of power imbalances, and less reliance on international law. A further point on Xi Jinping, if I may. While much has been written about Xi's Chinese dream of great rejuvenation, it was in fact Jiang Zemin who first sought to publicly reframe the Chinese Communist Party's purpose to be the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Hu Jintao doubled down on that phrase when he became leader in 2002, and Xi Jinping later made it his own. Now, this is not to doubt Xi's extraordinary power. I'm not doubting it. But to again underscore the point that China's new brand of nationalism, based on this master narrative of humiliation on one hand and rejuvenation on the other, has been deeply inculcated into the Chinese psyche now over many years. Other events, in particular the, the GFC, gave China an enormous boost of confidence and changed their calculation of the power of the United States. And it encouraged the Communist Party leadership to finally draw a line under Deng Xiaoping's maxim to hide and buy. And COVID-19, of course, has given China even greater motivation to assert itself internationally, and thus, here we are. And so having made some of those comments about China, the question then becomes, what does this mean to us? What does this mean to Australia? I'm conscious of time tonight, so I won't drain too much, but let me at least make a few points. First, Australia should not accept Chinese Communist Party's <laughs> reframing of our nation within its own master narrative. It is not for us, of course, to dictate to China how they should internalise their own national story, to build their own national identity. That is absolutely a matter for the Chinese. But it is absolutely for us to refuse to accept any deliberate attempt to wrongly frame Australia's or intent to suit their interests at the expense of our own. Let me try to explain this by way of an example. You might recall when China's ambassador to Australia chastised Australia last April for calling for an independent investigation of COVID-19. He accused us of, his words, teaming up with anti-Chinese elements. It's kind of pandering to the assertions that are made by some forces in Washington, he argued. Siding with and doing the bidding of 
the United States are regular complaints of China. Indeed, these accusations feared prominently in their list of 14 grievances. Framing Australia as if we are nothing but an extension of the United States allows China to effectively dismiss our position as being truly our own position. By wrapping Australia into their master narrative, it invokes a deeply emotional trigger about Australia in the Chinese psyche. Now, while this mobilizes support in China, it limits China's diplomatic options abroad. Invoking past wrongs perpetrated by foreign powers and suggesting we, Australia, are part of some foreign plot that threatens China, leaves its diplomats with little room to move, forcing them to take a hard line. In turn, they find it hard to compromise without looking weak. Tensions escalate. Zero-sum games start to emerge. And I believe this is what has happened with the Australia-China relationship. I also believe it's a weakness in China's playbook. Like any country, China is at its best when it enjoys strategic flexibility. But China's new brand of nationalism constrains them by invoking emotional triggers about historical humiliation and threats to waste. This is why, when under pressure, its spokespeople feel obliged to demonstrate a patriotic fervour that the Chinese Communist Party has them themselves sought to engender or they risk looking weak or losing face. Although China's master narrative does work best at home in China, it hasn't stopped them from using it abroad. Indeed, they've used their narrative to justify coercive behaviour against countries like Australia. The world is watching right now as China seeks to punish Australia economically. By teaching us a lesson, they also warn others about the consequences of getting China offside. What's more, they can't afford to be seen to lose, and this makes the situation even more difficult to resolve. It hasn't escaped the world's attention, however, that China is picking on Australia. In doing so, it is practising the very behaviour it purports to oppose as a bigger, stronger, and they believe morally superior power. It is effectively bullying a smaller power against which it has no historical grievance a country that has never done them wrong. This is another reason why China considers it so vitally important to frame Australia into their narrative of past grievances and foreign plots, because to do otherwise risks diluting their moral authority in the eyes of the world. We should not accept this framing because it is patently untrue. On the question of what China's approach means for Australia, the second point I'll make is that we do need to find new ways of working with like-minded nations. Following on from the argument about China framing Australia as part of a foreign plot in cahoots with the United States, something really interesting did happen of late. You might recall that earlier this year, President Joe Biden's Indo-Pacific coordinator, Kurt Campbell, stated, we have made clear that the US is not prepared to improve relations in a bilateral and separate context at the same time that a close and dear ally is being subject, uh, subjected to a form of economic coercion. He's referring to Australia. Britain followed with its High Commissioner to Australia, Vicky Treadle, calling out the coercive actions of China and stating, we do not think that Australia has been treated well. Then the United States officials carried a similar message into discussions with their Chinese counterparts in Alaska in March. What was interesting with all this was the fact that in the face of a collective, a collective pushback, China blinked. China blinked. Despite actively framing Australia as an extension of the United States, 
to avoid the shame of unfairly picking on a smaller power that has no history of wrongdoing. As soon as Washington spoke up, as soon as Washington told Beijing that its economic coercion of Australia threatened their bilateral relationship, China's foreign ministry rapidly tried to untangle their narrative and made public comments claiming the tensions between China and Australia were entirely just bilateral, just between China and Australia, nothing to do with the West or the United States. Or Australia's fault, of course. This was short-lived because no sooner had the US-China bilateral discussions concluded than China's deputy head of mission in Australia told the press club that Australia had connived with the United States in an un unethical, illegal, immoral suppression of Chinese companies. But nevertheless, as little an episode as that was, I think it illustrates two things. One, China does respond to collective action. And two, there is an appetite among liberal democracies to openly condemn the waging of economic tax in defence of allies. It's worth noting US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's comments, I think it was only last week, when he said that the US will not leave Australia to face economic coercion from China alone. I personally believe, therefore, it is time for us to build on this momentum and find new ways of working with liberal democracies and other like-minded countries on how to respond to issues of economic coercion. A part of the solution to my mind is to adopt the principles of collective security and mutual assistance. Principles that are typically found in defence agreements to guide international cooperation in this regard. The days of treating um, security and economics as separate domains are, are well behind us. While liberal democracies like ours try to separate security and economics in China, the two are steered by the one hand, the Chinese Communist Party. Finding new ways of working together to combat economic attack could range from jointly funded compensation schemes to defray the cost of attack, whether it be loans or grants, through to coordinated yet lawful retaliatory action. Strategically, we need to limit China's ability to use our own liberal values against us by substituting supply from one free market economy to another. This conundrum is riddled with challenges. I don't for a moment suggest trying to work this out will be easy at all. But we could at least start with transparency measures to track trade diversions resulting from economic coercion and explore schemes of recompense and possibly, albeit this being a lot harder, targeted boycotts or sanctions. We could consider expanding existing military alliances to explicitly accommodate mutual defence against economic attack or leverage the Quad or G7 for this purpose or maybe create new alliances or forge ad hoc agreements that bring like-minded partners together as required. Either way, we need to recognise that China is using economics as a tool of statecraft and we need to work with others to respond collectively. Unfortunately, we can't rely on existing international institutions to do the job for us. Institutions like the United Nations and World Trade Organisation, I believe, are incapable of dealing with economic security issues and I would question whether they possess the legitimacy to do so anyway. Moreover, transforming these international institutions to combat economic coercion would require a bargain as big as Bretton Woods, even if the United States were to champion such an endeavour, it would be arduous and slow going, which is why we need to look for new ways of working together, not to substitute existing institutions, but to supplement 
The third point I'll make and what China's approach means for us is the need for more of a Team Australia approach. I'm pleased that recent legislation has allowed us to deal with Victoria's dalliance with China's Belt and Road Initiative. It was a ludicrous situation that despite the Australian government making a decision to decline to formally sign on to the BRI, that other Australian jurisdictions moved ahead anyway to sign on themselves. Yes, we are a federation, but we are also a commonwealth. We are a nation. We are far more than just a collection of polities open to be picked off one by one. We need to work together. Let me touch on two other areas where I believe Team Australia is most important. First, with the business community and then with the Chinese Australian community. When it comes to the business community, China's punitive trade penalties may appear to be a simple strategic decision for them to use economics as leverage over Australia because we are over reliant on their economy. I do believe that is part of the rationale, by the way. but it's not the only part of the story. I believe their strategy is far more nuanced and multi-layered. For starters, while everyone knows China is playing a political game, they dress up their trade penalties as technical complaints to provide themselves cover under international law. Next, they know there's a limit to how we can respond because unlike their system, we don't direct our companies on who they should trade with for political purposes. And thankfully, we don't. And then there's another layer to their strategy of economic coercion. That is, I believe they're trying to throw us off our, our centre of gravity, if you like, by playing a psychological game. Sun Tzu, Chinese warrior philosopher, once advised, cause division among them. And this is precisely what China's punitive trade measures aim to achieve. They seek to sow division between Australian businesses and the Australian government, so the former, by pressure, the latter, to follow. As China's trade sanctions have bitten, senior business leaders have lined up publicly to offer the Australian government gratuitous advice about how to improve relations with China. Every time this happens, China smiles. Now, some of this advice is good, but some is pretty unhelpful, especially the motherhood statements about the importance of relationship building, and cultural tips about losing face and you know, talking behind closed doors. China loves it when we look disunited. I know even this week, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijia was out there welcoming comments by the CEO of the Australian Industry Group, saying he's visionary because, in his words, he is calling on the Australian government to reflect on its China policy. Every opportunity, so division, accentuated. Now, we in public office also have a job to do. We have to keep stepping up when it comes to engaging with our own business community and the associations that represent them on trade issues, but also on issues relating to China. And we need to do so more frequently, and we need to speak very plainly and candidly to business leaders. When it comes to then Chinese Australians, our objective here must be to strive for unity. I reject any attempt on behalf of China to expand the notion of sovereignty beyond territoriality or nationality, to include claims based on ancestry or ethnicity. In other words, China does not speak for our 1.2 million Chinese Australians. It is important that all Chinese Australians know that the actions of the Chinese Communist Party do not diminish them in our eyes, nor the respect we have for them as their fellow Australians. Chinese Australians are immensely important 
members of our nation, of our local communities. They deserve absolute respect. And we need to recognise the important role they play. And we need to also recognise the fact that when the Australia-China relationship is strained, it can be particularly difficult for them, which is why the rest of us who do not have a Chinese background must always stand shoulder to shoulder with the Chinese-Australian community, because that's what Team Australia is also about. Now, I'm conscious, Carl, of time, and so why don't I wrap up here and open up for, for any questions and any other comments I was going to make. I'm sure I can cover it off in the Q&A. Thank you, Ted. That was terrific. I'm glad that my predictions as the quality of the speech is better than my footy, <laughs> footy tipping, but uh, I, I don't have to retract, retract the comments that I made earlier. I'm sure that everyone found that fascinating. Uh, I, I'm going to open up the Q&A, but I might just start with one if I can uh, take that liberty. Thank you. I was going to ask a bit of a story. He did say, said that I'm going to retract that one, actually, um, just based on where you took that discussion. <clears throat> it's a topic that I'm very passionate about, as you are as well. I'm sure people have attended this evening because they had their own passion for the topic. And I, I totally understand where you're coming from with this idea of Australia's national values, our national interests, uh, talking about the journey that we are on as a nation and talking about how that is with the journey that China is currently on as a nation. And I understand your point about China seeking to reframe our position in the world as a nation. As a, as a student in the early 1990s in China, I used to have you know, as a student, you didn't converse about business, you converse with taxi drivers. That's how you, you practice your Chinese. But the taxi drivers used to say, from Australia, I love Australia. You've never fought us in a war. We have a very good relationship with your country. And I breathe a sigh of relief, thinking, gee, what would they say if we're American <laughs> um, or English or French or German or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, and I would hide my German ancestry uh, just in <laughs> case that became a problem. Um, so I, I get this idea of the reframing. I understand where that's taking place, but uh, my concern is the comment about Team Australia because I understand what, what you're talking about with um, reframing China, reframing Australia, but aren't we, by using this reference to Team Australia, to some extent reframing ourselves? Because I get... The federal government's opposition to what the Victorian government did with the BRI memorandum. Um, but my view on what you were saying in respect of understanding culture, including the concept of face, which is what I did my PhD on, um, I don't think they are throwaway concepts. I think that uh, Australians, frankly, need to be doing more to understand Chinese language, more to understand Chinese culture. Uh, so that we can be better placed to understand how we interact with China in the future. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that point uh, and, and then perhaps give a question associated with that, which is uh, what is the federal government's view on, you talked about what we want to look like in 50 years, but what is the federal government's view on what we should be doing now uh, in terms of educating Australians on dealing with China and learning the language and so on, so that we can be better positioned in 2050 to have a, a, a deeper and, and stronger understanding of China and hopefully a better relationship with China then than we do now. Carl, thank you. And so um, a, a disclaimer I probably should have set up front is rest assured, was that gone flat? Um, the comments tonight are my comments on comments that have necessarily been approved by any higher body, um, so they're mine. Um, but to answer your question, um, obviously um, the new Colombo plan is probably the most prominent um, of our policies that encourages young people um, to get experience through internships and study throughout Asia. 
and China obviously has been a enormously important um, destination market for that purpose. Um, I, I myself was a beneficiary of a federal government scholarship and I went to Taiwan. I worked full time for my then family business, but I also studied full time. And that was because I won an Asian Pacific Fellowship. I would have gone to Taiwan anyway, but I would have gone to university. Um, so I am a big supporter of schemes that allow younger Australians to um, spend more time <coughs> in the market, not just in China, by the way, but um, including China. I, I, don't, um, I don't dismiss the importance of the cultural aspects, and I know that from my personal experience. Um, my comments were one of frustration um, when I see business leaders who have very little experience in China use their own megaphone through the front pages of our newspapers saying the Australian government is going wrong and all they have is a cultural tip. That's a concern. That's the thing that frustrates them, right? There's a difference between you know, high-level uppercuts, which that is, and substantive advice. That's the point I was making. Um, I have to talk later about Team Australia. Um, I think it's a very easy way to communicate. Um, and so long as um, people understand that Team Australia is an inclusive Team Australia. Um, one of the unique, we have a few unique characteristics of our country. And I do believe we're the most successful for democracy. I believe we are the most successful multicultural country. And I'm also very proud of the fact that we have the oldest continuous living civilization known to humankind. And that's Australia. Uh, for me, Team Australia wraps around all of that. Um, and we need to be proud of that. Um, and I find it a good way to at least communicate with people in a group of Thank you. Uh, I wonder about the audience. Thank you. You, you referred to Melbourne's ill fated attempt to join the PRI. They were persuaded otherwise by the Australian government, unlike 140 plus countries in the world. But like the United States, Australia hasn't belonged, hasn't joined up with the BRI, and including 14 of our near neighbours. What does the Australian government think it knows that the Melbourne government doesn't know? If the Melbourne, if the Victorian government knew something we did not, they would have shared it through the multiple consultations we had them requesting an answer as to why they decided to sign up. Um, here is one of the challenges we have. Again, I make this comment on my own behalf, not on behalf of the government. Right? Um, what is the BRI? How many contracts can you look at? Are there differences between those contracts? Is there a standard protocol of BRI? What are the standards of BRI? As a country, we are involved in a lot of international treaties. Um, right now, we're negotiating a whole bunch of them. And so we're, we're pretty strict on this stuff. Um, there is not the degree of transparency and standards in the BRI networks as Australia would typically accept. Now, that's my own view of it, right? Um, as for any um, uh, consideration by Cabinet, or um, the National Security Committee or others, I'm not privy to that, so I can't comment on it. It's probably a good thing because I wouldn't be able to comment on it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted to ask, Sarah, uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Um, let me be provocative for what you have to think. One is that I'd be very worried if the Australian government is trying to pursue a policy where it would undermine global frameworks of UN and chart out its own regional or hegemonical kind of strategy to cope with China. That's, that's one option. A weekend event has already been weakened, and thanks to the efforts of the countries that we know who weakened that 
uh, and that's brought to me actually uh, invite uh, to me that would invite a prolonged period of probably conflict in the region itself. And my second question would be: in order to pursue a balanced foreign policy, we need to not only look at the challenges, we also need to look at the opportunities. And from your presentation, you basically highlighted the geopolitics and political dimension of certain geopolitics, but you don't quite focus on the economic aspect of it. And in fact, you dismiss it saying that our business community do not understand you know, the, the international relations, which I find is a little limiting. Thank you. Sure, there's a question there. Ted, I'll give you a moment. Uh, thank you. Um, why don't I start with the, the last one and then I'll go to the first if, if I remember it properly. Um, my, my message is not that the business community don't want to be there at all. My message is simply that the business community and the Australian government need to work closely together. The onus is on both sides. I made that very clear, including the Australian government. We need to engage more. We need to speak more plainly with them. Um, we cannot have a situation where Australian businesses know very well there's a political game afoot, and we have either um, members, uh, officials, or parliamentarians um, saying that, oh, no, they're just technical complaints. Um, we're Australian. Um, we need to speak honestly and transparently. The Australian business community, there's stuff we need to do like that. Um, as for the Australian uh, business community, um, I was commenting again about some unhelpful, very large tips that plays in to um, the narrative, I believe, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, are there opportunities? Absolutely, there are opportunities. Um, I think the fact that we have had some of these challenges, um, I wonder what it's going to be like in 10, 15 years' time, whether or not businesses will look back with the benefit of hindsight and question whether the challenges with China forced a diversification that balanced their risk profile. Um, I'd like to think that is the case. We know already that our, um, our exports to China, um, um, certainly the iron ore price has helped. Um, remains very strong. Um, we are a free trading nation. We import capital. Um, continuing to enjoy um, an integrated global economy is absolutely key for Australia. There's no doubt about that. Um, business does have a role to play. Point being tonight, government and business in Australia need to work closer. Yeah, that's the point. Um, I spent 20 plus years in business, mainly up in the region, uh, before politics. I am very aware of what most senior business people think, politicians. And, um, and that's okay. That's fine. Which is why we need to engage. And we need to do, do it our way, which is straight talking, plain, candid, and honest. Um, as for, I think I understood the first point. Um, I, I certainly not suggesting Australia should aim for some sort of regional hegemonic role ourselves. Um, and I don't believe in, um, in, in a leaving or promoting the collapse of the United Nations or any of these international institutions. I personally believe these international institutions are struggling. I really do. I think they are struggling enormously. But anybody who thinks we should vacate the field or try to convince the United States to make it a foolish, I believe, because it would create a void that would be filled very quickly with another structure based on values that are clearly not our own. Um, so when it comes to the international institutions and then when it comes to the economic side, there are some um, who particularly last year were suggesting an economic decoupling from China. Um, I'm absolutely opposed to that. Um, at the end of the day, that would be to cut off our nose to spite our face. We need to continue to trade. We need to diversify. We need to find other markets and all of that. The point that I made tonight, which is not dissimilar to the point I made in the financial review last week, we need to work with um, other liberal democracies to work at how we're going to respond to these economic attacks. I don't have the answer for it in terms of how. What I present tonight were some solutions that if you're going to sit around the table and have the conversation. The challenge we have, and maybe this is what you're getting to, and I, if it is, I agree with this one. 
The reason it hasn't been done before is because you go too far down that path and you move away from the very liberal values that underpin free trade. And that's why it's such a conundrum for us. But unless we put our mind to it, we start discussing with allies and other liberal democracies, it'll never happen. I think we've got time for one more very quick question. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, can I just say online audience? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a question from Tim Florin. Uh, when do you think Australia and our like-minded democratic partners will or should move to more progressive and full recognition of Taiwan? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you for not a very controversial question at all. <laughs> <laughs> Australia has no plans to change its position with respect. <laughs> thanks you just that grenade uh, very nicely uh, look thank you very much ted uh, i think we really enjoyed your talk tonight it's been frank and forthright and decisive and you can tell by the crowd we've got here tonight that uh, this is probably the the best event we've had this year i like the way you put the historical dimensions of china and how they've moved nationalism and assertiveness and they've also given us some the way forward you know the team australia idea unity on the home front and sort of working with the business community i'd like to also announce that you are now a member of AA queensland for the next year what a hell of a vetting process you go through to get <laughs> yes, it is, it is. Okay, we've got some new events coming up. June 22nd, we've got Professor Helen Bartlett of the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Sunshine Coast, issues affecting overseas students in Australia. <clears throat> and then July 20, so July 6th, His Excellency Mark Glauser, High Commissioner of Canada, and he'll be speaking on middle power diplomacy. 2021. So come to those events and one more round of applause for Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.